foreign policy. Professor Huntington, what is the clash of civilizations? Well, the clash of civilizations is a phrase I created to uh, describe what seems to me to be a central feature of the post-Cold War world as far as international politics is uh, concerned. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, countries were grouped into three major blocks, uh, the free world uh, led by the United States, the communist bloc led by the Soviet Union, and then the third uh, world of uh, non-aligned nations, including uh, obviously India as a prominent member, uh, where a lot of the struggle during the Cold War took place. Well, those three blocks uh, have passed into history, and so the question is, uh, what will be the major groupings of states in the post-Cold War world, and what factors will uh, shape uh, uh, the relations among states? I think the book uh, suggests, and, and, and the ideas you have propounded suggest, uh, a moving away from popular perceptions that it is, it is sort of economic imperatives that might determine well, that's, that's true. Uh, I, obviously, economics is important, and uh, economic issues and questions of uh, trade and investment are central to uh, the relations among countries, as are access uh, to resources, uh, important resources like, like oil. Uh, but it seems to me if one looks at what is happening in the world today, uh, uh, states are realigning themselves along cultural lines, uh, whereas it, during the Cold War it was uh, a, a a politics and ideology that predominated now in the relations among states. Now it is uh, culture, and states with similar cultures are coming together. Uh, states with different cultures are, in many cases, moving apart or actually splitting up, as we have seen in the cases of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, which were. Uh, two uh, states which encompass the peoples of several different civilizations, and they both broke up. Yet there is a, a popular perception in some senses that uh, with the globalization of the media and, and let's shall yeah. we say the Americanization of the media, yeah. <laughs> that in some senses that uh, global civilizations and cultures are becoming more homogeneous. So you have, you know, the Chinese civilization is more American in some ways perhaps <laughs> yes. than it was before. Well, there certainly are the, those aspects of, uh, of globalization taking place as a result of the tremendous increase in transportation communications. And uh, obviously a lot of this involves Americanization because of the extent to which the uh, United States uh, corporations and uh, uh, other entities uh, dominate uh, uh, these uh, facilities for communication and transportation and obviously uh, American popular culture is uh, uh, tremendously popular around uh, the world in the movies and uh, the consumer uh, goods and uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc. Uh, but uh, in many respects it seems to me that uh, much of this is relatively superficial and uh, people uh, can adapt uh, the global American culture, uh, but uh, underneath they still, um, uh, with the other half of their lives, they still uh, maintain their traditional uh, uh, practices, beliefs, ways of life uh, of their particular civilization. And I think it's very important to draw a distinction between westernization and modernization. Uh, because all societies want to modernize and, and people want to become wealthier and uh, be able to benefit from advanced technology, uh, but they don't necessarily want to become westernized. You, you, you have projected the idea that, in, that, that, that the major class of civilizations will be between the United States and China. Uh, if you were to sort of in, in, in indulge in a, a bit of futurology, uh, what do you think will happen when this clash takes place? Is, is, is there going to be a winner or...? Well, the, I, I'm not quite sure what the character of the clash will be. I think uh, if a Chinese economic uh, growth continues uh, at anything like uh, the rates which it has for the past a couple of decades, uh, clearly uh, China uh, will uh, uh, become more and more assertive in international affairs. And this is quite natural when countries uh, uh, develop industrially, become economically uh, stronger, they do become more assertive uh, in global politics. This is true of Britain and France, uh, Germany, Japan, the United States and the Soviet Union. And it's to be expected with China. 
Uh, there is always the problem, however, of the uh, uh, accommodation of a rising power into uh, the existing uh, global system. And many people uh, draw a comparison between the rise of China at the end of this century and the rise of Germany at the end of uh, the last century. And of course, the rise of Germany uh, eventuated in two world wars. And what we wanted to do was to avoid that with the rise of China and be able to uh, uh, work out arrangements and accommodations. Uh, uh, this puts a particular uh, uh, problem uh, of, uh, before the United States uh, because the Chinese have indicated that uh, they expect to resume their uh, hegemonic position in East Asia, a position which they had for centuries uh, down until the middle of the 19th century. And the United States has always opposed the domination of either Western Europe or East Asia by another power. And indeed, uh, uh, we fought two world wars and a cold war uh, in this century to prevent that from happening. And so it seems to me uh, the uh, crucial uh, uh, relationship in the coming years is uh, between China and the United States and trying to work out some form of accommodation. Uh, you have, uh, you're, you're described as a, as, as a polit distinguished political cartographer. <laughs> what is the map that you see of, 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 of the different groupings that are now emerging? Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, the major groupings that are likely to replace the three blocks of the Cold War are the world's uh, principal uh, civilizations, Western civilization, uh, uh, Islamic uh, civilization, uh, uh, Cynic or uh, Confucian civilization, Indian civilization, Orthodox civilization, Japanese, Latin American, African. It seems to me these are the natural uh, groupings of states in w uh, global politics uh, now. You have confronted, uh, shall we say, experienced some controversy uh, over your, your, your pointing to, to the processes that Islam is going through and as being uh, a source, shall we say, a center of, of, of significant conflict in yes. the globe. Well, I, I think that's the case. Um, uh, clearly, uh, the Muslim world is in the midst of a tremendous Islamic resurgence, and uh, Muslim societies are uh, becoming uh, more Islamic and, and Islamist in uh, their behavior, beliefs, uh, uh, way of life. Uh, and this is a great cultural revival or renewal. Some people have compared it to uh, the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Uh, uh, several hundred years ago, which also was an effort to renew Christianity in Europe and to uh, uh, purge uh, uh, Christianity of uh, uh, corruption and other things that had happened uh, in, uh, in the Catholic Church at that time. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I think one has to uh, uh, view this Islamic resurgence as an effort in many respects at purification. Now, of course, it does have an extremist element uh, that turns to violence, uh, uh, and uh, this is exacerbated by the fact that uh, in recent decades, Muslim uh, societies have had very high birth rates, and this has led to the creation of a big youth bulge uh, in Muslim societies of people between the ages of uh, 15 and 25, and uh, history shows that uh, uh, when that uh, uh, age grouping uh, amounts to more than 20 percent of the uh, people in a society, uh, that uh, then there is a great likelihood of instability, violence, upheavals, revolutions, and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, and uh, this is, I think we can see, uh, is occurring in Muslim societies and that there is a very high level of social violence of Muslims against Muslims and Muslims against non-Muslims. Do you see that uh, with, with, with diasporas, in a sense, crossing yeah. national yeah. boundaries, that uh, this, this, the, the notion of the clash of civilizations, which is really based on, on looking at the, the historic evolution of, of how different cultures and societies have, have arrived at new balances yeah. of power yeah. and influence, uh, how is this going to impact uh, you know, the United States has a very large Chinese diaspora? Sure, sure. What, well, I, I think uh, one of the uh, fascinating uh, consequences of the uh, modern, recent uh, improvements in transportation and communication 
is uh, that it makes it possible for people who are in a, a diaspora uh, to maintain much closer contact with the culture of their home country. Now, we see this in the United States in the uh, large numbers of uh, uh, immigrants, uh, recent immigrants we have from Latin America who now can keep in very close touch with uh, their homes and villi in villages and towns in uh, Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America. And this raises questions in, people mind, in people's minds as to what extent will they really become Americanized. Uh, and uh, in Germany, 80% uh, of the Turks who are in Germany watch Turkish TV. Uh, and uh, obviously they can maintain close contact with Turkey. You can fly back and forth very quickly and, and easily, and uh, they are remaining in large part of, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, involved in the Turkish world. And uh, this uh, upsets the Germans and uh, causes great problems for the, uh, for the Germans. They don't know how to react to it. <laughs> As these processes of, of, shall we say, integration in some ways uh, intensify, and, and, and you were to look ahead 20, 40, 50, 100 years, uh, do you see that the nature of um, the clash of civilizations, which for the present seems to sort of coincide with the clash of national nationalities and yeah. the nations, will somehow change what you see as, 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 as future long-term sources of conflict? Well, uh, I, I think it's very hard to look into the future, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, emerging pattern of, uh, of world politics dominated by uh, cultural and civilizational factors uh, uh, may not last very long. Uh, for 40 years or so, uh, world politics was shaped in the Cold War framework. Uh, uh, now it seems to me to be taking this uh, civilizational uh, pattern. Uh, but quite possibly, uh, the uh, developments could occur at some point in uh, 2030 or something, uh, which will bring a new pattern uh, to, uh, to world politics. Uh, po quite possibly, economic issues uh, could uh, come back and be of central importance. Do you have a, do you have a vision, uh, a, a dream of a, of a peaceful world? And, and, and what might be the elements that, that will... Well, uh, yes, uh, uh, the uh, people um, uh, uh, often accuse me of uh, 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 setting forth a self-fulfilling uh, a prophecy and that talking about the clash of civilizations is more likely to make it happen. Uh, but it seems to me it all depends how people react to it. Uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, uh, lots of very serious people thought that uh, a nuclear war between the United States and, S and the Soviet Union was virtually inevitable. That didn't happen. Uh, because uh, 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 people became concerned about it. And I hope uh, that people can become concerned about the possibility of a clash of civilizations and uh, will take measures uh, uh, to reduce that uh, probability. And I think uh, if we are going to have uh, peace in the world, it'll have to be organized on a civilizational uh, basis with the core states of civilizations, uh, countries like the United States, Russia, China, Japan, India, uh, others, uh, uh, playing the leading role in maintaining peace uh, within uh, their uh, area and then negotiating with the core states of other civilizations uh, to uh, try to prevent or uh, end uh, conflicts between groups from uh, the different civilizations. Uh, and one of the problems with the Islamic world, of course, is that there is no uh, major power, dominant power, uh, who, which uh, who is recognized by most of uh, the Muslim peoples as uh, their, as the uh, spokesman for Islam. Uh, I think the world would be a much more stable mm -hmm. place if there was a leading state in Islam. In, in addition to describing India as, as a core state, you've also described it as a, a swing state state right, yeah. in some ways in the context of the right, new emerging right, global order. Right. Uh, in, in what senses do you see India as a swing state? Well, uh, it seems to me uh, quite obviously uh, the West uh, is and will remain uh, the dominant, uh, the most influential uh, uh, civilization for years to come. It is facing in different ways uh, challenges from China and uh, from uh, the Muslim world and hence 
Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, Russia, Japan, and India, uh, the three other major powers, are in a sense swing states. It depend they will uh, how they align themselves will greatly influence. Uh, uh, how these interactions uh, between the West and the, what I call the challenger civilizations, uh, Islam and, and China, uh, uh, work out. And um, quite obviously, uh, uh, China is attempting to build, a, a, if not an anti-Western coalition of countries, certainly a non-Western coalition of countries uh, in order to counter uh, uh, the Western power and. Uh, the intrusions of the West into non-Western societies and Western uh, dominance of uh, the global institutions, and that's perfectly natural. And it seems to me a country like India is faced with choices as to uh, whether it wants to simply remain uh, outside of this uh, global politics, uh, the interaction of the major powers. Uh, or whether it would want to align with uh, China in a non-Western or anti-Western coalition, or whether it w would want to uh, co cooperate more fully uh, 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 with the West. Uh, uh, I <coughs> will argue, uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, that it seems to me that it's the third uh, course of action uh, which is mo would be most in India's uh, interest uh, to develop further uh, the its relations with the West and particularly with the United States. Would you say that, that India should sort of ally with the Western world and the United States because they might emerge winners in this clash? Well, uh, I, uh, I think uh, it's hard to say uh, whether anyone will emerge a winner or a loser as far as that goes. It may be uh, the, the results of the interaction may be uh, uh, totally inconclusive. Uh, it does seem to me that uh, the, uh, uh, India would uh, uh, benefit uh, from uh, cooperating uh, with the United States and other Western countries. Uh, uh, the United States is already the principal foreign investor in India and uh, India's major trade uh, partner. Uh, and uh, I, th I think it would be highly desirable to expand these ec economic relationships and also uh, uh, to introduce a, a greater degree of uh, uh, a cooperation on uh, political and uh, strategic matters. And uh, that, it seems to me, would be in the interests of India and uh, also in the interests of the, un of the United States. Do you think it is possible or that it might happen one day in the vocabulary of international politics uh, that we could we could transcend the idea of, of, of conflict or, or clashes between civilizations and 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 and, and reach a state of uh, well not even accommodation because accommodation has an element of of yielding of, of harmony coming to, of harmony yes well uh, I think uh, that gets back to the basic question of uh, uh, what what is human nature and uh, one doesn't have to go up to the uh, level of clashes of civilizations to see that there is something, it seems to me, in human nature that, uh, uh, first of all, makes people uh, uh, differentiate themselves from others and often emphasize the differences. This is the way we define ourselves, is by a uh, process of d differentiation. And then this process of differentiation leads to competition. If I am different from you, well, uh, I also want to be better than you, and you want to be better than me. And this leads to competition at the individual level, uh, between business corporations, between the political parties, so forth. Uh, and it seems to me uh, at the level of uh, uh, international relations and civilizations, a uh, degree of competition is uh, uh, inherent in that situation. And the problem is uh, to ensure that the uh, competition uh, doesn't uh, become violent. How seriously do you think that the, that the new age and the new consciousness movements, uh, you see so many cover stories in, in Time, yes. Newsweek, and, and, and what have you, uh, of the number of people in the United States now going to church, of, of, of the impact of Indian gurus in the United States. Uh, well, <laughs> I, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, for, let me make two points. First of all, the American people are very religious people. And uh, if one can believe public opinion polls, well over 50% go to church every week. 95% uh, say they believe in God. 
the United States is, I think, uh, uh, probably the only country in the world uh, that has on every piece of its currency the words, in God we trust. Uh, nonetheless, insofar as the United States is religious, it is, it is a Christian country. 85% or more of Americans uh, identify themselves as, uh, as Christians. Uh, uh, there are um, uh, uh, movements of other religions, um, including Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, the latest polls show, however, that uh, uh, less than one half of one percent of the American people believe in Hinduism and in uh, uh, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. You've also uh, articulated uh, the idea uh, of the relationship uh, between democracy and development. Yes. That, that the more yes. development you have, that that will inevitably lead to an affirmation of democracy. Uh, and, and, and China, in, in, in some ways, is, is central to your concerns about what happens right. in, in the next millennium or the early part of the next millennium. What do you see happening in China with, 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 with the growth of economic development? Well, uh, that, that, that's a, a central question. Um, uh, and uh, you, you said that development uh, uh, inevitably leads to democracy. I don't think anything is inevitable, but it's very likely to lead uh, to democracy. And uh, as, uh, as countries uh, uh, become more economically developed and expand the size of their middle class and uh, uh, become better educated, there is a naturally a demand uh, uh, for greater participation in government. And we have seen that very dramatically in East Asia. Uh, in uh, South Korea and in Taiwan. Uh, we went through a process of economic development and have now uh, become a democracies. Uh, I might just say also, of course, that uh, India is, is the great exception to this rule and that it became a democracy when it was still very poor. Now, with respect to China, one would ex uh, assume that as uh, China develops economically and as you have more and more uh, uh, capitalists and businessmen and a, a larger middle class, there will be pressures for uh, movement in away from uh, the uh, current political system. Uh, now whether this leads to something like Western democracy I think is uncertain. It could, but it might lead to something else, um, a, a different sort of democracy. Uh, people often forget that one country, which has many of the uh, uh, accoutrements of uh, a democracy, is Iran, which has highly competitive elections for both its parliament, which is a, quite an important body, and as we saw this past year uh, for uh, uh, its uh, president, uh, where the non-establishment, in effect the opposition candidate, won with 70 percent of the vote. Uh, this certainly doesn't make Iran uh, a democracy in the Western sense. Yeah, you have drawn a distinction between liberal and, <laughs> That's right. and electoral That's democracy. Right. That's right. This is, uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, and Iran is clearly in some respects qualifies as an electoral democracy, but certainly not as a Western liberal uh, a democracy. Uh, uh, and the other interesting question, of course, is even if China does become more democratic in some sense, what will uh, that? Uh, what effects will that have on its r international role? And there is a, a widespread assumption that a more democratic uh, country uh, will be more peacefully inclined and uh, will uh, be more friendly to the West. That may happen, but I don't think it's necessary because, as we have seen in many cases. Uh, democracy uh, can uh, provide an opportunity uh, for ambitious politicians to exploit nationalist sentiments, to appeal to ethnic prejudices, uh, to try to arouse people against a foreign enemy. Uh, uh, I'm not saying this necessarily would happen with uh, uh, democratization in China, uh, but uh, it's possible. You know, China has, through its history, seen sudden and, 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 and cataclysmic changes. Do you think that we're now in, in, at, at, at a time in its history where, where change may not be as sudden and as cataclysmic? Well, uh, I guess uh, surprises uh, can't be predicted. <laughs> if they could be, they wouldn't be surprises. And so uh, all sorts of uh, uh, surprising things can happen. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to say they wouldn't happen in China. Despite the sort of the, um, the how do you put it, the perils of, of, of prediction, 
uh, and, and in an age when, when sequels are, 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 are commonplace, you've had a, uh, a very influential, successful book, uh, which really comes at the, at, 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 uh, shall I say, uh, at, at one stage in the process where you've done more than 12 books and 90 scholarly articles. Uh, but is there a sequel to, to, to the Clash of Civilizations or beyond the Clash of Civilizations? What might happen? Well, uh, I don't know whether there'll be a, a sequel to not, uh, or not. Uh, uh, my institute at Harvard uh, did have a conference this fall uh, which brought together uh, people from all the major civilizations and countries uh, to discuss the different perspectives on international order. Uh, and I would hope uh, we may be able to uh, uh, put, a, put together a book out of that conference and uh, try to identify uh, uh, to what extent there are uh, elements of agreement in the way in which uh, uh, people from these different cultures uh, look at the, the international system and, and to what extent there are um, uh, elements of disagreement. Do you look ahead beyond this cycle of history? Of well, I, as I said before, I can't, you know, I, 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 I'm very uh, skeptical about how useful it is to try to look very far into, into the future. Uh, probably um, uh, 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 what I've described as the politics of civilizations uh, will uh, 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 describe uh, uh, what is going on in the world. Uh, uh, for the uh, next couple of decades, I, w I wouldn't want to try to go beyond that. Professor Huntington, thank you very much.